What is up, everyone? My name is Joseph, and welcome back to Casually Competitive MTG, where it's our goal to bring you semi-competitive EDH gameplay content that is both fast-paced and entertaining. In today's episode, we took some commanders that have been recently maybe overshadowed in at least the top tier CEDH play, so we took some of those and paired them with some new legends to the format. So in today's episode, we will be featuring Brea, Emery, Lurker of the Lock, Helia, the Sun Crown, as well as Joyra, Weatherlight Captain. This episode will be a double header. However, in game number two, unfortunately, Nate wasn't able to make it for the game we recorded, so we replaced Emery with another mono blue deck with Adam's Brawl. So you can expect that in game number two, and the timestamps for both games should be on screen now. Before we get into the opening hands, we have a few quick channel promotions. The first one being if you want to help support the channel, we have a Patreon link in the description. We really appreciate everyone who does help us out in this way, and it really does go a long way to help improve the quality overall. We also have an online store link in the description where you can pick up some casually competitive themed merch. Also, if you're planning on buying cards in the near future, if you click on the TCG affiliate link in the description below, any purchase you make after clicking on that link will directly help the channel at no cost to you. And finally, we are affiliated with Flipside Gaming, where if you use our code CASUALLYMTG at checkout on eligible purchases, not only will you get a 10% discount off of your purchase, but you will help out the channel as well. And now, as the shield timer comes to a close, let's get into the opening hands and deck introductions. Going first in game number one is Bill playing Joyra Weatherlight Captain. Now, this build is not your standard Joyra build. It doesn't just run Cheerios and get just a lot of value off of Joyra. It does do that, and it plays a lot of low-cost artifacts, but the main win condition in this deck is to use a card like Polymorph to turn any like 1-1 one, one token into Tide Sprout Tyrant and then generate infinite mana and card draw by bouncing some mana positive mana rocks. There are also backup lines in this deck that include Underworld Breach and Brain Freeze lines. Bill's opening hand contained a Steam Vents, an Arid Mesa, a Shivan Reef, a Chrome Mox, an Izzet Signet, a Fabricate, and a Wheel of Fortune. Going next is Joseph playing Heliod the Sun Crown. This is a mono white stack deck that looks to slow down the table, all while looking for a two card combo with Heliod and something like a Triskelion or a Walking Ballista, with a backup line in this deck being Helm of Obedience and Rests in Peace. Joseph's opening hand contained two planes, a Mox Opal, an Aether Vial, a Sensei's Divining Top, a Tithe, and a Smothering Tithe. Going third is Jordan playing Brea Ethereum Shaper, playing what I am going to refer to as Brea Combo Queen. Jordan just packed this deck full of infinite mana combos with the goal to generate infinite mana and then use Brea's ability to win. This deck is not running consultation lines and really just hard focuses on generating infinite mana while also controlling the board. Jordan's opening hand contained a Flooded Strand, an Arid Mesa, a Mana Crypt, a Lotus Petal, a Brainstorm, a Ristic Study, and due to the London Mulligan, he put a Pact of Negation to the bottom. And finally is Nate playing Emery, Lurker of the Lock. The goal of this deck is to just do mono blue things and stop people from playing spells, all while using Emery's ability to kind of generate pseudo card draw by dumping cards into his graveyard and then using Emery's ability to replay them. This gets a lot of value with cards like Mistra's Bobble, but it also allows him to dump combo pieces into his graveyard and then replay them later in the game. Nate kept his second set of seven cards, and his opening hand contained five islands, a Conjurer's Bobble, and a Flusterstorm. And remember, if you want to watch these games live, we stream them on Twitch, link is in the description, every Sunday at 6pm EST. And if you want to vote on your favorite deck from this pod, there's a Twitter poll link in the description since YouTube has disabled their in-video poll system. And now, without any further delay, let's get into the gameplay. Bill starts us off in this game by drawing, shocking in a steam vent, paying 2 life, and then for 0 mana, casting a chrome mox. When it enters the battlefield, he imprints a Fabricate, and he then taps for 2 mana to cast an Izzet Signet. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph, on his turn, plays a Plains as his land, and then for 1 mana, casts an Aether Vial. He then for 0 mana, casts a Mox Opal, and with nothing left, ships the turn to Jordan. Jordan, on his turn, plays an Arid Mesa, immediately paying 1 life to crack it, to search up a Steam Vents, paying 2 more life to have it enter untapped. He then for 0 mana casts a Mana Crypt, and again for 0 mana casts a Lotus Petal. He then taps his Crypt and his Land to cast a turn 1 Ristic Study. The Ristic Study resolves, and Jordan gives the turn to Nate. Nate plays an Island, and then for 1 mana casts a Conjurer's Bobble. He does not pay for Ristic Study, and Jordan draws, and with nothing left, Nate gives the turn to Bill. 
Bill, on his turn, untaps, plays a Shivan Reef as his land, and then taps his mana to cast his commander, Joyra, Weatherlight Captain. He neglects to pay for Ristic Study and, with nothing left, ships the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and, in his upkeep, puts a counter on Aether Vial. He then plays another Plains as his land for turn, and then for two mana, casts a Sensei's Divining Top, paying for the Ristic Study tax, and with nothing left, gives the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps and in his upkeep takes three damage from losing his mana crypt trigger, and he then plays a Flooded Strand as his land for turn, and with nothing left to do, gives the turn to Nate. Nate untaps, plays another Island as his land, and he then taps his mana to cast Emery Lurker of the Lock for two mana, since it is reduced by one due to having the Conjurer's Bobble. He does not pay for Ristic Study, Jordan draws, and then Emery resolves, and when it enters the battlefield, he mills the top four cards of his library, so with nothing left to do, he gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, plays an Arid Mesa, and then taps his mana to cast a Chromatic Star, paying an extra mana for the Ristic Study tax, and drawing a card on cast from Joyra's ability. He then pays one mana to sacrifice the star to add a blue mana to his mana pool and draw another card. He then pays one life to crack his Scalding Tarn to fetch up a mountain to the battlefield, and he then pays three mana to cast a Cursed Totem, making sure to pay for Ristic Study. Jordan, in response to the Joyra draw trigger, taps for one mana to cast a Brainstorm. He draws three cards, puts two from his hand back on top, and then with no further responses, Bill draws his card, and then the Cursed Totem resolves. With nothing left, Bill gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and in his upkeep puts another counter on his Aether Vial. He then plays a Blast Zone as his land for turn, and he then taps his mana to cast a Smothering Tithe, not paying for Ristic Study. In response to the Ristic draw, Joseph activates his Aether Vial, and in response to this activation, Jordan pays one life to crack his Flooded Strands to search up a Watery Grave, paying two additional life to have it enter untapped, and he then taps for two mana to cast a Mana Drain targeting the Tithe. The Mana Drain resolves, the Tithe is countered, and then the Aether Vial trigger resolves and Joseph puts Athalia Guardian of Thraben onto the battlefield. With nothing left, Joseph passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, wins his Mana Crypt trigger in his upkeep, and then draws and at the beginning of his first main phase adds 4 colorless mana to his mana pool from Mana Drain. He then pays 3 mana for a Talisman of Progress due to the Thalia on the battlefield, and then as his land, plays a Windswept Heath. He then pays 2 mana for a Mana Vault, and he then pays 1 life to crack his Windswept Heath to fetch up a Hollowed Fountain, paying 2 more life to have it enter untapped. He then uses his mana to cast his commander, Brea Ethereum Shaper. As she enters the battlefield, he gets 2 Thopters onto the battlefield, and he then goes to pass the turn to Nate, and on Jordan's end step, Nate activates and sacrifices his Conjurer's Bobble to put the recently milled Laboratory Maniac from his graveyard to the bottom of his library, and then draw a card. Nate then goes to his turn, untaps, plays an island as his land, and then for one mana due to Thalia, casts a jeweled amulet, and he does not pay for Ristic Study. With nothing left, Nate gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, plays an island as his land, and then taps for four mana to cast a Wheel of Fortune, not paying for Ristic Study. Jordan draws, and everyone then discards their hands, draws seven more cards, and with nothing left, Bill gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and, in his upkeep, puts a third counter on his Aether Vial, and he then, for four mana, casts an Aura of Silence, not paying for Ristic Study. It resolves, and he then plays a Prismatic Vista as his land, and with nothing left, ships the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps and, in his upkeep, wins his Mana Crypt Flip, not taking any damage. He then plays a Polluted Delta as his land, and he then goes to combat and swings both of his Thopters at Bill. Bill takes the 2 damage, and Jordan then tries to go to his end step, and in response, Nate puts a counter on his jeweled amulet, and then Jordan successfully goes to his end step and discards down to hand size, discarding a World Gorger Dragon. Nate then goes to his turn, untaps, plays an island, and thinking that it's probably wise to keep up some mana, passes the turn to Bill. Bill on his turn, untaps, and then for 3 mana, casts a Preordain, paying the Ristic Study tax. He scries two cards to the bottom, draws a card, and then with nothing to do, moves to his end step, and in response to moving to his end step, Joseph pays one life to crack his Prismatic Vista to search up a Plains to the battlefield, and he then uses his Plains to activate his Sensei's Divining Top, rearranging the top three cards of his library. Bill then continues to his end step and discards a Windfall to hand size, and then Joseph goes to his turn, 
untaps, draws, plays a planes as his land. He then taps for two mana to cast a soul ring, not paying for Ristic Study, and he then uses the soul ring to help cast a rule of law. Again, not paying for Ristic Study. Rule of Law resolves and Joseph goes to pass the turn to Jordan. And on Joseph's end step, Jordan pays one life to crack his polluted delta to search up an island to the battlefield. And he then taps his mana to cast an overloaded Cyclonic Rift. The Cyclonic Rift resolves. All opponent's permanents are bounced to their hand. And then, with the Rule of Law now gone, still in Joseph's end step, Jordan taps his mana to cast a Mystical Tutor. It resolves, and he searches a Pact of Negation to the top of his library. Jordan then goes to his turn, untaps, loses his Mana Crypt trigger in his upkeep, and then in his draw step takes 1 damage from Mana Vault remaining tapped, and he then draws a card for turn, plays a Sun Scorched Desert as his land for turn, and when it enters the battlefield, he has it deal a damage to Joseph. He then taps his Mana to cast an Animate Dead. In response to the Animate Dead, Nate taps his mana to cast an Arcane Denial, targeting the Animate Dead. In response to the Arcane Denial, Jordan for 0 mana casts a Pact of Negation. In response to the Pact of Negation, Bill for 2 blue mana casts a Muddle the Mixture, targeting Pact. In response to the Muddle the Mixture, Jordan taps his mana to cast the answer that he has, which is, is it Charm, targeting Muddle the Mixture. Muddle is countered, Arcane Denial is also countered, and then Animate Dead then resolves, animating the World Gorger Dragon. Now with these permanents on the board, Jordan has a loop where he can essentially blink all of his permanents, since when the World Gorger enters, it'll exile all of their permanents, including Animate Dead, and when Animate Dead leaves, the World Gorger Dragon will leave, returning all permanents, including Animate Dead, which will allow him to retarget World Gorger to repeat this loop, and since he has a Sun Scorched Desert on the battlefield, he can use it to ping down all of his opponents, winning Jordan the game. Now I do want to get right into game two, but let's do a little bit of a post-game discussion to talk about something that I am really passionate about, which is stacks. Now I could go on for a very long time about how to play around and play with stacks effectively, but the thing I want to focus on here is the rule of law and the cyclonic rift. Now, during the discussions at the table, I, as the owner of the Rule of Law, was aware that Nate and Bill both had control or a way to stop the Cyclonic Rift, and with the Rule of Law on the battlefield, Jordan couldn't have really protected his Rift at all. However, the Rule of Law was really stopping what Nate and Bill wanted to do, so they felt it was more beneficial to them to let the Cyclonic Rift resolve and then try to stop Jordan on his turn. Unfortunately, Jordan had just drawn too many cards for them to realistically stop him, and I think that's something that's fairly common with people who play against Stax. Now, Stax does have a tendency to slow down a board state, and if you're affected by it, it's usually very enticing to let the removal piece go through. However, you do want to be careful. The person removing the Stax piece most likely has a big play they want to make with the Stax piece gone, so you have to really evaluate whether or not you can get more advantage out of that stacks piece being gone than another player. Even though a stacks piece may affect you, it may be affecting someone else more, so sometimes you can use that to your advantage and you can wait, maybe protect the stacks piece until you can be in a position where you can most take advantage of that stacks piece being gone. That all being said, that is all we have for game number one and let's head right into game number two. Going first in the second game is Joseph playing the same Heliod deck as the previous game, and his opening hand contained two planes, a Chrome Mox, a Weathered Wayfarer, a Silence, a Scrapyard Recombiner, and an Uba Mask. Going second is Jordan replaying the Brea deck from earlier, and Jordan's opening hand contained a Command Tower, a Misty Rainforest, a Flooded Strand, a Dark Ritual, a By Force, a Dark Confidant, and an Is it Charm. Going third is Adam, and like I mentioned at the beginning, Nate wasn't able to make it for the second game, so Adam decided to take his place with another mono blue deck, which is Baral Chief of Compliance. The goal of this deck is very, very simple. It's to play mono blue, control the board, and then get additional value off of this control by looting through your library with those counter spells. The win con of this deck is to cast High Tide at least one time and generate enough mana to cast Enter the Infinite and then win with his library in his hand. Adam's opening hand contained two islands, a Sapphire Medallion, an Arcane Signet, an Isochron Scepter, a Mana Drain, and a Teferi Master of Time. And finally going last is Bill playing the same Joyra build as earlier, and his opening hand contained six cards, and those cards were a Cascade Bluffs, a 
Flooded Strand, a Swan Song, a Red Elemental Blast, an Is It Signet, a Cloud Key, and he put a Jace Wielder of Mysteries to the bottom. Now with the opening hands out of the way, let's get into the gameplay. Joseph starts off this game by drawing, playing a Plains as his land, and for zero mana, casting a Chrome Mox. When it enters the battlefield, he imprints his Silence, and then for two mana, casts a Smuggler's Copter. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Jordan. Jordan, on his turn, plays a Command Tower as his land, and then for one mana, casts a Dark Ritual. It resolves, he floats three black mana, and with two of this, he casts a Dark Confidant, and he then lets the final mana fizzle as he gives the turn to Adam. Adam starts off this game as any blue player should, by playing an Island, and then for zero mana, casting a Chrome Mox. When it enters the battlefield, he imprints a Mana Drain, and he then taps for two mana to cast a Sapphire Medallion. With nothing left, he ships the turn to Bill. Bill draws, plays a Flooded Strand, and then pays one life to crack it to search up a Steam Vents to the battlefield, paying two life to have it enter untapped, and with nothing left, he gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, plays a Plains as his land, and then for one white mana, casts a Weathered Wayfarer. He then crews his Smuggler's Copter with his Wayfarer, and then goes to combat and swings three damage at Jordan in the air. On attack, he loots with the Smuggler's Copter, drawing a card, discarding an Uba Mask, and Jordan then takes the damage. With nothing left, Joseph gives the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps and in his upkeep reveals a Sacred Foundry to the Dark Confidant trigger, and then draws a card for turn. He then plays a Misty Rainforest and goes to combat and swings his Dark Confidant back at Joseph. Joseph declares no blockers and takes the two damage, and with nothing left, Jordan gives the turn to Adam. Adam untaps, plays an island, and then taps for two mana to cast an Arcane Signet. It resolves, and he then taps his mana to cast his commander, Baral, Chief of Compliance. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, plays a command tower as his land, and for two mana, casts an Is It Signet. He then ships the turn over to Joseph. Joseph untaps, plays an Ancient Tomb as his land, and then takes two damage from this Ancient Tomb to help cast a Scrapyard Recombiner. He then for two white mana casts a Grand Abolisher. In response to this Grand Abolisher, Jordan pays one life to crack his Misty Rainforest to shock in a Watery Grave, taking two more damage. He then taps his mana to cast an Is It Charm. Unfortunately, Is It Charm does not counter creatures, so Jordan decides to choose the mode to draw two and discard two, discarding a Polluted Delta and a Sacred Foundry. Joseph then, with priority back on his turn, crews his Smuggler's Copter again and goes to combat and swings 3 damage at Jordan in the air, looting on attack, drawing and discarding a Grasp of Fate, and Jordan then takes the damage, and Joseph then gives the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, and off of the Dark Confidant trigger, he reveals an Ad Nauseum, losing 5 life. He then draws, plays a Forbidden Orchard as his land, and then for 1 blue mana, casts a Mystic Remora. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Adam. Adam untaps, plays a Gemstone Caverns as his land for turn, and then taps his mana to cast a Gilded Lotus. He then taps this Gilded Lotus to help cast the new Planeswalker to Fairy, Master of Time. He then upticks to Fairy to draw a card and discard a card, which was an Isochron Scepter, and with nothing left, Adam gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, plays a Cascade Bluffs as his land, and he then taps his mana to cast a Cursed Totem, not paying for Mystic Remora, so Jordan draws. Then, in response to the initial cast, Adam, just because he can, upticks his Planeswalker to draw a card and then discard a Frantic Search, and Cursed Totem then resolves, and Bill gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, and immediately crews his Copter, and then goes to combat and swings the Smuggler's Copter, the Grand Abolisher, and the Scrapyard Recombiner at Teferi. On attack, he loots from the Copter, drawing a card and discarding a Plains, and in response to these attacks, Adam ticks up to Teferi to draw a card, and he then discards the Pact of Negation, and declares no blocks, and Teferi goes to 1. Joseph then goes to his second main phase and taps his mana to cast his commander, Heliod the Sun Crowned. With nothing left, Joseph gives the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps and reveals a Faithless Looting to the Dark Confidant trigger, losing one life, and still in his upkeep decides to not pay for Mystic Remora. He then plays a Flooded Strand as his land, and he then taps his mana to cast a Mana Vault. In response to the Mana Vault, Adam upticks his Planeswalker again to draw a card and discards an island. Jordan with priority back decides to tap his mana to cast a Talisman of Progress, floating one mana from Mana Vault, and he then taps for a red mana to cast a Faithless Looting. 
He draws two cards and then discards an ad nauseum and a swamp. He then taps his mana to cast a Cabal Ritual, giving Joseph a 1-1 spirit from the Forbidden Orchard being tapped for mana, and in response to the Cabal Ritual, Bill, not wanting to know what Jordan wants to spend this mana on when Ad Nauseam is in the graveyard, decides to tap for one mana and cast a Swan Song. Swan Song resolves, Jordan gets a 2-2 Flying Bird, and Jordan goes to pass the turn to Adam, and on Jordan's end step, Bill taps for a red mana to cast Red Elemental Blast, targeting Teferi. There are no responses and Teferi is destroyed. Adam then goes to his turn, untaps, and goes to combat swinging Baral at Bill. Bill declares no blockers, takes one Baral damage, and then, in his second main phase, Adam taps his mana to cast Chart a Course. He then uses some of his floating mana and delves some cards away in his graveyard to cast a Treasure Cruise to draw three cards, and he then casts a Spellseeker. The Spellseeker resolves, and when it enters the battlefield, he gets a Glimpse of Freedom, and with nothing left, he gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, plays an island as his land, and he then taps his mana to cast his commander, Joyra Weatherlight Captain. He then goes to pass the turn to Joseph, and on Bill's end step, Joseph taps for two mana to cast an Abeyance. He targets Jordan with this targeted Silence, and when it resolves, he draws a card, and he then goes to his turn, untaps, plays a Welding Jar for 0 mana, and then uses his Spirit to crew his Copter. He then goes to combat and swings his Copter at Jordan, on attack, drawing a card and discarding a Land Tax. Jordan does not block and takes the damage, and in his second main phase, Joseph plays an Emergence Zone as his land for turn, and he then goes to pass the turn to Jordan, and on Joseph's end step, Jordan pays 1 life to crack his Flooded Strands to get a tapped Steam Vents to the battlefield. Jordan then goes to his turn, untaps, reveals a reflecting pool to the Dark Confidant trigger, and he then, in his upkeep, pays 4 mana to untap his mana vault. He then plays the reflecting pool as his land for turn, and he then gives the turn to Adam. Adam on his turn, untaps, plays an island as his land, and then taps his mana to cast a Ristic Study. The Ristic Study resolves, and Adam gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, and then for 3 mana casts a Cloud Key. He decides to pay an extra mana to pay for the Ristic Study tax. He then draws a card off of Joyra's ability, and as it enters the battlefield, he names Artifacts. He then, for one mana due to the Cloud Key, casts an Isochron Scepter, not paying for Ristic, drawing off of Joyra, and when it enters the battlefield, he imprints Brain Freeze. He then, for zero mana, casts a Sensei's Divining Top, again, not paying for Ristic, so Adam draws, and Bilden draws off of Joyra. In response to the initial cast, Adam decides to cast a Negate, countering the Divining Top. The Negate resolves, and Adam loots, drawing a card and discarding an island off of Baral's ability. With nothing left, Bill gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, and then for zero mana, casts a Lotus Petal, not paying for Ristic. He then for 1 white mana casts a Fragmentize, targeting and destroying the Cursed Totem. He did not pay for Ristic Study, so Adam again draws, and Joseph decides to tap and activate his Scrapyard Recombiner, sacrificing his Welding Jar to search up a Walking Ballista to his hand. He then takes 2 damage from Ancient Tomb to help generate enough mana to cast this Walking Ballista, X equaling 2, and when it resolves, he pays 2 mana to give it lifelink. With these pieces on the battlefield, Joseph can take 1 counter off of Walking Ballista to deal a damage to any of his opponents, gaining life, and when he gains life, he puts another plus 1 plus 1 counter on Walking Ballista due to Heliod's ability, and with this loop active, he can just ping his opponents down, dealing enough damage to them to win the game. Now I know this video is getting a little long, so I'll keep this post-game recap on the short side, but I do want to just highlight the new Teferi card, Teferi Master of Time, because while playing this game, I just found this card to be really, really strong in my opponent's hands. I was playing the Heliod deck, and Teferi being on the battlefield and having a significant amount of loyalty was very scary to not only me, but also the Joyra deck who needs to polymorph a token, and even the Brea deck who needs artifacts to sacrifice. It's a very scary piece, and the fact that it can tick up so many times in a turn cycle is actually a force to be reckoned with, and I found myself worrying about it more than I expected to when I saw it on the battlefield. I think this card's really cool, it's interesting and unique for 
a Planeswalker, and I think it will see some play in these mono blue controly decks because I think it just generates a lot of value. Being able to loot once per turn cycle and just build up loyalty, eventually being able to bounce multiple creatures in a turn cycle if needed, or take extra turns I guess if you really wanted to, although I don't see that being as relevant, but just the control aspect of it for 4 mana is still very valuable, and I found it to be a very interesting card to play against, so I just wanted to point that out. That being said, that is all we have for this episode, and that does complete season number three. That means since we have all of the winners from the four games, we will see a finale between Elsha of the Infinite, Blood Pod, Sursu Demir Lobotomist, and Brea Ethereum Shaper, and that will be out in the very near future. And if you want to vote for your favorite deck from this pod, you can help shape the fan favorites by clicking the Twitter poll link in the description. Like I said, that is all we have for this episode. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it and have a fantastic rest of your week. I am Joseph, this is Cashing Competitive MTG, and we will see you next time.